Last Sunday, a and &E aired their latest biography, this one on Kurt Angle. This was tremendous stuff. They went way more in-depth on his life pre-WWE than I thought they would. Uh, I have not watched the Rivals episode yet on him and Brock Lesnar, but I thought this was the best biography of all the ones that they've done yet. Even going back to last season, I thought this was the best one that they've done. They interviewed a whole bunch of people for this. They interviewed some of Kurt's brothers. Uh, when they were covering his amateur wrestling stuff, they had a bunch of amateur wrestlers and former Olympic champions, Bruce Baumgartner, Kevin Jackson, who was another Olympic gold medalist, Sylvester Turkai, who was a rival of Kurt's in 1992, who later on had a, a stint in pro wrestling. He was even signed by WWE. I know he was in OVW for a while. And they were going to do something with him, and, and he never went anywhere. But they interviewed all of these people, and what was great is they had all the footage. So Kurt would be talking, or some of these guys would be talking about certain amateur wrestling matches that Kurt had, and boom, there's the footage. You know, for example, the moment that Kurt broke his neck during the Olympic trials for the very first time, we get to see exactly how it happened, which is jarring to see. You think about all the neck issues he's had over the years because he never bothered to get his neck fixed the first time like he should have. And it all goes back to that one moment, just the way he landed, and he's explaining what happened, and boom, down he goes, and it's just, it's jarring to see. But they had all of this footage spliced in, uh, and it was just great. And a big portion of this was dedicated to David Schultz, who was Angle's coach at the Foxcatcher camp, if you've seen the movie, uh, who was shot and killed by John DuPont, the man who ran Foxcatcher. It basically bankrolled the entire thing, and he was he was a weird guy who got weirder as the years went. Clearly, mentally, he had something going on, and he ended up uh, killing David Schultz. This was months before the 96 Olympics, and Schultz's widow, Nancy, was interviewed for this as well. They talked about after, you know, Dave was killed, Kurt wanted to pull out a foxcatcher and just leave the entire thing. And she called Kurt when she found out about it. She made the call to Kurt and said, look, I'm starting the David Schultz uh, camp or whatever she was calling it. I would like for you to be the first member. And Kurt was honored. He said, oh, of course. Of course I'll do it. I mean, he revered this guy. Uh, and that was a, a, a major tragedy in his life. But they drove home just how obsessed Kurt was at being the best. And I knew this. I've heard the stories about his Olympic training going up the hills with the, not just the logs on his shoulders but other people <laughs> carrying people he would overtrain they showed uh what may have been the actual like calendars and stuff he had you know they had everything all mapped out for everything he needed to do this was inhuman what he put himself through in preparation for those olympics was just it was not human but that's how driven he was they had to watch him his own coaches were saying we had to watch him because he would do too much. And if you overtrain and you do too much, that's how you get hurt. And they were concerned about him because they knew the guy was like a machine. He didn't have an off button. But they do address the, the first broken neck at the Olympics. And they talked about how the doctors, he talked about how the doctors would shoot his neck up with Novocaine. So he wouldn't feel anything. <laughs> he wouldn't feel any pain, which sounds performance enhancing to me. He openly talked about one of his tougher opponents, you know, and they showed the footage going for his neck, grabbing his neck as they're wrestling around. That's part of his strategy. Kurt couldn't feel anything. So he had the guy all confused when he kept taking the guy down at will. This is a great moment. If you look at the guy's face on one of the takedowns, it might have been the losing takedown. He just has this look on his face like, holy shit. Like he couldn't he couldn't believe it. I don't think I would be very happy to find out that the other guy, the reason that he beat me was because he couldn't feel anything in his neck. His neck was all shot up. But anyway, he made it through, and eventually he won the gold medal. And, you know, he talked about winning the gold medal in the Olympics. You come out of that, and, you know, Olympians can get sponsorship deals and things like that. Some of them end up becoming a coach, and now they want to train the next generation. But you're a young guy. You just won the Olympics. You come out of it, and you ask yourself, what the hell am I going to do now? If you're an amateur wrestler, you get to that level, you win the gold medal, where do you go from there? So he was approached by WWE. They had him on their radar. They offered him a 10-year contract. He didn't say exactly for how much money. I'm sure he said it was very good money. 
It was a very generous deal. Very similar, probably, to the deal they gave Mark Henry. Mark Henry signed a 10-year contract. And Mark Henry never even won a gold medal. So they offered a 10-year contract to Kurt in 96, the same year he won the Olympics. And Kurt met with Vince at, you know, Titan Tower. And he was potentially going to sign the deal. He told Vince he has one contingency. And his one contingency was that I have to win all of my matches. And he said once Vince heard that, Vince shook his hand and he sent him on his way. And that was the end of that. But he says it was a couple of years later. He was watching the show He saw because he wasn't a big pro wrestling fan. He really never watched it. His brothers, when he was younger, said, oh, it's that silly fake stuff. You don't want to watch that. So he never bothered with it. He didn't grow up watching Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man and all these different people. But he was sitting around two years later in 98. Austin now is he's being launched into the stratosphere. He sees Stone Cold Steve Austin on TV. And he just he's blown away by this and he thinks it's so cool and it's so so much fun that it causes him to reconsider and he reaches out to WWE to see if he could get the old deal that they offered him 2 years before and Jim Ross said no. <laughs> you have to try out like everybody else. And he said if we sign you, we're going to sign you for the lowest guarantee that we're offering right now. So he went, and they had footage of him at the Dory Funk Jr., the Funkin' Dojo, and he's training, and uh, he earned it. He earned a contract, and he signed with WWE. And he took to it faster than anybody that I have ever seen. Brock Lesnar is another one. But I think Kurt Angle is, is I mean, he, he took to this faster than anybody I can think of. And he could do it all. There was no hole in his game. He wasn't physically the biggest guy in the world, but he was a world-class athlete, we know that he could go in the ring, stamina, you know, strength, endurance. He had all of that. He could play the goofball character. He could play the wrestling machine, whatever you needed him to do. Kurt excelled at every aspect of pro wrestling. His work in the ring was better than anyone else in the business at that time. His character work was every bit as good. Many times I laughed out loud at a Kurt Angle promo or a backstage segment, especially the stuff he did with Steve Austin in 2001 during that invasion period. One of the few good things to come out of that period. That and the Austin return on Raw the week before the invasion pay-per-view when he came out and everybody went ape shit and he gave stunners to everybody. What a great moment that was. And then he went back to being a heel six days later. I would say, I would argue that from probably 2001 maybe late 01 to 2003, maybe 2004. There was nobody in the world, bell to bell, better than Kurt Angle. He was incredible. Just look at the matches that he had in his WWE run, which wasn't that long. It was, it was six years, I think, barely six years. Look at the body of work that he put together with the people he worked with, the matches he had with Chris Benoit, the matches he had with Edge. That really put Edge on the map as a single star. The matches with Brock Lesnar. The SummerSlam match with Rey Mysterio. The No Mercy match with him and Benoit against Mysterio and Edge. The WrestleMania match with Shawn Michaels. One of the all-time great WrestleMania matches. The No Way Out match with The Undertaker in 2006. By which point he was already deep into his addictions. And he was still putting out matches like that. He was very open on this special about his drug addiction issues. He admitted that at his worst point, he was swallowing 65 painkillers every single day just to feel normal. Imagine taking half that just to feel normal. 65. He said it was enough to kill a horse. When he would wake up the next morning, he would be in withdrawal. Just from those few hours overnight that he didn't take anything, he was having withdrawal symptoms. So he'd have all the pills that he needed laid out on the nightstand. So as soon as he woke up, He could down the pills. He can crush them and down them. This man broke his neck three times in a single year. Two of those broken necks that year came from Brock Lesnar. He had four DUIs in five years. That came during the period that he was working for TNA. Kurt had a lot of problems off screen during that 10-year period that he spent with Impact. That's where the whole Perk Angle thing comes from. They didn't cover any of the drama with Kurt and his wife. You know, then wife Karen, who had been, uh, they were separated at the time. Jeff Jarrett and Karen started dating. Jeff's wife had died of cancer in 2007. 
And we don't know exactly when he and Karen started hooking up, but Kurt admitted, he's admitted in the past, that when he and Karen were separated, he cheated on her. I think he mentioned that on Howard Stern. And he claimed that Karen was getting back at him by dating another wrestler, I assume that being Jeff Jarrett. But this was a big controversy at the time, and when Dixie Carter confronted Jeff about it, he lied to her. And when she found out later there was an anonymous TNA employee or insider who, I think, called into some kind of radio show and exposed the whole thing, she went back to Jeff and she found out that he had lied to her and she suspended him for lying to her. But Angle and Jared, they ended up, you know, (laughs) they're not on, uh, you know, bad terms. They ended up turning the whole thing into a storyline and they worked together and they ended up having some pretty damn good matches together. Jim Ross, though, was one of the talking heads who was interviewed for this special. He referred to Angle's TNA run as a disaster. And that was really the extent to which they even addressed him being in TNA. They didn't cover his TNA stuff at all. But Jim Ross said that his run in TNA, he called it a disaster. Now, if he's referring to all of the outside stuff, then yes, you could say that it was a it was a disaster for Kurt personally. Kurt has credited Dixie Carter with saving his life by hiring him after he left WWE. He wanted to wrestle. He wanted to work. And if he didn't have that outlet, who knows how much more destructive he may have gotten. But at the time, that's not how most people saw it. And frankly, I look back on it, I I still don't see it that way. It definitely raised eyebrows when Dixie hired Kurt, knowing full well the reasons why he left WWE. You have to be completely fucked up. As big of a star as he was, Olympic gold medalist, former world champion, WrestleMania headliner, for Vince McMahon to say, you know what? We're going to let you go. You want out? We're going to let you go. I'm not even going to fight it. Let's just part ways. I'm going to let Kurt Angle go. Give him his full unconditional release. There was no non-compete or anything. He, he let Kurt go. Because he could see this is going to a very bad place. We can't get through to this guy. You have to want to help yourself. He doesn't want the help. We're going to let you go. That's how bad off he was. Didn't face Dixie Carter. She swooped right in immediately and signed Kurt Angle, knowing full well the reasons why he left. The man needed help. She gave him a job, put him right back in the ring on TV. She saw a major WWE name that she could put on her television show, and she signed him. Even though, if we're being honest, Kurt had no business being in the ring at that time. He had bigger issues that needed to be addressed. And his work in the ring did not suffer at all, which is why it was so weird to hear Jim Ross say that, well, it was a disaster. I don't think anybody would look at Kurt's body of work in TNA and call that a disaster. He had excellent matches. He spent more time, believe it or not, with TNA than he did in WWE, his first run. His TNA run was longer. He had excellent matches with Samoa Joe and AJ Styles. I mentioned Jeff Jarrett, Sting, Abyss, Nigel McGuinness when he came in and he was doing the Desmond Wolf character. He put together a pretty damn good body of work. I would hardly call his TNA run a disaster. He was part of the whole main event mafia thing. I look at Kurt Angle, honestly, at what he did for TNA, and I think it's comparable to what Terry Funk did for ECW. Terry Funk gave ECW a level of credibility that they did not have. And Paul Heyman has credited him. He was a major part of the success that ECW went on to have. He came in at a time when a a star of his caliber probably wouldn't have wanted to have anything to do with ECW. I look at Kurt Angle kind of the same way. That's how important he was to TNA. So I can understand why Dixie Carter would have wanted to snatch him up right away. Thankfully, he didn't kill himself, and it ended up being okay. But you cannot downplay the importance of Kurt Angle signing with that company and what he brought to the table for them. He was a major, major pickup for them. But Kurt Angle talked about his sister dying of a heroin overdose. This was the day before his 60-minute Iron Man match on SmackDown with Brock Lesnar. He got the call, found out that his sister had died of a heroin overdose. Kurt has dealt with some heavy shit in his life. His father died when Kurt was just 16 years old in a construction accident. His coach was murdered six months before he won the gold medal in the Olympics. His sister died of a heroin overdose. I think his mother died of cancer the year after that. 
That's a lot of tragedy for one person, not to mention all the pain and the addictions that stemmed from the broken neck that he never bothered to fix in 96. That was self-inflicted. Can't blame anybody else for that but himself. He should have had his neck fixed. But that's a lot for one person to take and to see him come out all right on the other side when a lot of people did not think that he would be here today at all, above ground. Vince McMahon didn't want him working for WWE anymore because he didn't want a dead Olympic gold medalist under contract. They kept their distance from him for many, many years. And it's a happy ending to a story that could have ended very differently.